All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Rose. I'm the Exhibition and Programming Associate at the Benda. Thanks so much for joining us today for the 21st talk in our Cold War Spaces series. Today, our guest is Joanna Stingray on the topic of connecting space, rock music between East and West. She's a singer, actress, music producer, and writer with a fascinating life story that we're lucky to hear more about today. Her memoir, Red Wave, an American in the Soviet Music Underground, was just released last week on Doppelhaus Press. Today's program will be about a 30-minute conversation between Joanna and Segal, the Vanda's chief curator and director of programming. After that, we'll leave about 15 minutes for Q&A, so please get your questions ready to put in the Q&A box during that time. Uh, we appreciate everyone's questions as always, but please keep them short and concise, um, no longer than a sentence or two. For other comments or discussion, we have the chat box open, so feel free to say hi, um, and it's always nice to see what city you're tuning in from. Um, and we have signups from all over the world today, um, and as usual. Um, and please, when you're putting anything in the chat box, there's the blue button that says two. Make sure that's switched to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, um, the, everyone else can't see it. And we'll be posting today's recording on our Vimeo page, so you can look afterwards um, and watch all of our other virtual programming. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank Susan Horitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda in their virtual programs. And now I'll hand it off to you to get started. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna Rose. Whereas uh, yesterday's presidential debate once more exemplified the power of politics to divide, today we are going to talk about the power of art and music to connect. Joanna Stingray bridged the opposing camps of the Cold War as hardly anyone else constantly moving between Los Angeles and Leningrad, and later Moscow, introducing a touch of American culture to the Soviet underground music scene and a taste of Soviet rock music to an unsuspecting American audience. We will speak about extraordinary life choices, conversations with the KGB and the CIA, and the transformative power of rock music. Joanna, congratulations on your new book, Red Wave, and welcome to Cold War Spaces. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. So let's uh, start with um, uh, delving a little bit into history. In 1962, your father, Sidney Fields, wrote, directed and produced the documentary The Truth About Communism, narrated by then Governor of California, Ronald Reagan. So its message might be clear. How does a young woman with this political background start a career as a rock star in the, un in the Soviet Union? Fate, I guess is the real answer, fate. But I, I did grow up and I remember my father in his office splicing reels of tape and he worked on it for many years. He was so passionate about spreading this word about the evils of, of communism and, and always told me don't ever go behind the Iron Curtain. So I grew up with this scary feeling of this, this far off land that was supposed to be dangerous and awful. Um, and on the other side, being young, it always stuck in my brain, I want to see it. You know, when you're told not to do something, you're motivated to do it or to look at it. The forbidden fruit uh, idea. Of course. Right. Okay, so um, uh, when you actually did go to the Soviet Union, you became part of the Leningrad underground music scene. Can you tell us a little bit how that came to be and uh, uh, how you um, got involved there? Well, I went over on a one-week trip as a tourist through London. It was very difficult in 1984 to get over there. And the first part in Moscow confirmed what my father had said. Everybody's in dark blues and, and black, and they look unhappy, and it looks like an awful place I'll never return. But when I got to Leningrad, I met the father of Russian uh, rock and roll, Boris Grimichikov, who's in the photo, and he was known as the Russian Bob Dylan. And once I met him and heard his music, everything changed. And I, I just, the way I looked at life and everything was opened up in a different way. So I, I was just passionate about becoming part of this and getting there as often as I could. So through Boris, I ended up meeting a lot of the other rockers as well. And they were underground rockers, which meant they couldn't make a living from their rock music. They mostly played home concerts. In 1981, uh, there was a place open that was called the Rock Club in Leningrad, and this was basically un opened under the umbrella of the KGB because these 
burgeoning underground bands were becoming quite famous all over the Soviet Union just by releasing their music on two track tapes, on reel to reel tapes and cassettes that would be copied. Some of Boris's albums would be copied in a month a million times as far as Vladivostok on the east of Russia. So they opened this rock club to give them a place they could perform, but that they could also keep an eye on them. So, it, right. you know, everything in Russia is, nothing's as what it seems. There's always contradictions. There's always things lurking behind. Um, but at least the rock club that became a very uh, infamous place in Leningrad and, and throughout all of Russia, um, let more people see them live and with electric instruments, unlike um, their home concerts that were mostly just acoustic. Wow, fantastic. And uh, I see so many people uh, actually watching there. How, how did people know about these concerts? Were they just uh, publicly announced or how did that work? No, it, it, again, they were not official. There were official rock bands in Russia and those were people's jobs where they uh, got money, but they were also very censored and told when to go play and do things. These artists um, wanted to be pure and they were some of the free freest artists I've ever met. They didn't make any music. Um, the rock club concerts were all word of mouth. The rock club sold tickets, so they made money, but none of the musicians got money. Um, but the musicians seemed okay about that. You know, they had complete freedom in what they were doing, and they, they seemed totally fulfilled by that. Right, and how, and how did they hear about these concerts? How, uh, was that word of mouth? Or it was mostly or? word of mouth, and especially right. when they did the home concerts, which they continued to do even though they played at the rock club. You know, it was word of mouth, and you know, everybody knows when, you're, when things are limited or you're not allowed to do something, you want it even more and you find a way. And in Russia, rock really wasn't real rock and true rock wasn't allowed, so you could understand the hunger from these people to get it and to get it from the black market, um, you know, to get it from tourists that come in. You know, they, they were just really innovative in their ways to figure everything out, including when and where there were concerts. Right, right. So two weeks ago, I spoke with uh, the historian Juliana first about uh, the Soviet hippie movement. They wondered, uh, were the rock musicians part of that movement or were they two separate worlds? Well, you know, I assumed on my first trips that they were all hippies because of how they lived. And if you looked at the, the photos that are up now, many of them lived in communal apartments. Right. And also everything in Russia looked 30 years older than America. I felt like I was in an old film from the 50s. So that kind of vibe of communal living and, and because they were all kind of on the same level and didn't have much money, the open door policy would just show up at somebody's house and go, I felt like they were all hippies. You know, my favorite word in Russian is tusavka, and it means spending a lot of time doing nothing. And that was our lifestyle. You wake up, nobody has a phone, you just go and knock on their door, they let you in, you're chatting, they throw together any food they have and make you a meal. There's guitars on everybody's wall, eventually it comes off, they're singing. After three, four hours of boredom at that house, you go to somebody else's house. To me, that, was reminiscent of what I believe the hippie life was. Um, right. So I think again, because of their circumstances, they were a little bit like that. But you know, looking back now from writing my book, really only the older generation were the hippies. Uh, you know, Boris and and Mike Nalmanko from Zoo Park that's in that picture, they were seven, eight, nine years older than Kino and Elisa. So the older ones really were were had that uh, hippie mentality and Boris certainly was a hippie. I see, yeah. So you mentioned uh, Kino and Alisa. One of the very remarkable things you did was produce a double record in the United States, uh, also called uh, Red Wave, by the way, in 1985, with four of the most uh, prominent uh, Soviet underground rock bands, Kino, Aquarium, Strange Games and Alisa. How did you manage to do that and what kind of obstacles did you have to overcome? You know, everything I did in Russia wasn't planned. It kind of just rolled one thing into another. And when I first went to Russia, like most Americans at that time in 1984, I couldn't imagine there could be any rock in Russia. And when I saw them and heard them, and it, it shocked me and opened up my eyes, I would come back and tell people here and they would laugh. No, there's no rock in Russia. So then I would try to show them photos. Eventually I would show them videos. 
And I quickly learned the power of music and the power um, that I had in my hands. And it made me understand that I can open up, you know, millions of Americans' eyes by putting together an album of these four bands and with music videos to show them something we had in common with the Soviets. You know, what we were being fed in those days through our news and, and through the press was all just bad, evil empire, don't go behind the iron curtain. So I, I really felt like I had this tool that could bridge our two countries together. And, it, and again, getting out the music because they were underground was not easy. So I did have to smuggle everything out. Thank goodness I had a little bit of help from some of the Western consulates in St. Petersburg, in Leningrad at that time. The Swedish consulate, the French consulate, and the US consulate would go to these underground concerts. They loved these bands. So uh, they would invite them over for some parties. I was invited over too and became friends with them. So they did help me get some of the tapes out. But I just, again, had to be inventive. When there's a will, there's a way. And when you're young, you're fearless. So I was, right. you know, I had a, a pair of a Sorrel big winter boots and I could take the insult out and stick all of their, their Russian lyrics in there. I had this jacket with tons of zippers and I would stick some of the two track tapes in zippers and wear my backpack. You know, you just do whatever you need to do to make it happen. Fantastic. And uh, you were so well connected. You mentioned the consulates, but your book is also full of uh, the most uh, exciting stories. Just to pick two of them, you um, got David Bowie to donate an electric guitar and uh, Andy Warhol to donate signed Campbell soup cans. Can you tell us how that came about? You know, again, every time I came back from Russia, I really was like a missionary. I spent all day trying to show people and convince people about these incredibly prolific um, rockers there. So um, when I came there the first time, Boris had told me that there had been an American before I got there that worked with Bowie and took some of Boris's music back and that supposedly Boris loved it and was interested. So when I got back uh, through Boris gave me a number, I called Boys Management Company and sent them more photos and music of Boris's and Bowie was was totally taken by by what Boris was doing over there and asked how he could help. And when I'd asked Boris, you know, like a light bulb, he Fender Stratocaster, you know, the one complaint of the underground rockers, because I interviewed them all, the only complaint they ever had was the access to good equipment. It was very difficult for them to get equipment, to have money for equipment. And um, so Bowie paid for this guitar that you see uh, Boris playing right there. And then with Warhol, I had known him, I'd met him um, through my parents that were very involved in the art world. And my friends knew all about Andy Warhol and loved him. So I went to, one day to see him at the factory and brought a big photo book with photos of all of the um, artists. Many of the rockers were also the artists. You know, it was just kind of the 60s vibe that they were just creative in, in many, in multi multiple ways. And uh, when I showed Andy the photos of their artwork and I actually brought uh, two of their pieces of artwork with me, um, Andy lit up and he was so excited that halfway around the world there was this art that was so inspiring and it reminded him of the graffiti art like Basquiat and Keith Haring. So I said, hey Andy, if I go buy some soup, can you sign it to my friends? And he said yes right away and he didn't know what he was getting into because he literally signed 20 cans. I was spelling out each one of the Russians' names. He signed some books, as you can see. And this photo was of, of the rockers and the, the new um, painters who were this collective of artists that um, were also in many of the rock groups. So it was, it was needless to say, they were thrilled, thrilled when they got all of the Warhol stuff. But I will say, I was shocked the day after I gave them all the cans of soup, I went to their apartments the next day and could not believe that they had all opened it and ate the soup. And they said, yeah, we love that the can was signed by Warhol, but we wanted to know what American soup tasted like. So it was- That it was, was more important, yeah. More important, it was crazy. That's fantastic, yeah. So moving between the uh, United States and uh, the Soviet Union, you attracted the attention of both the KGB and the CIA. And can you tell us a little bit about your interactions with those secret services? You know, from the very beginning, there were subtle signs. Every time I tried to call the Soviet Union, it would either be busy, you would get disconnected right away, you would talk 
a sentence or two and, and disconnected and then busy. So there were always signs after a while when I started renting cars in the Soviet Union, I, could, I kept thinking, I'm being followed, am I being followed? Well, it, it, after I think the first year, um, there were more concrete signs. And with the FBI, they ended up questioning me through a very circuitous, manipulative way of calling my mother and asking her to talk about my dad's film from the 60s. And they had been divorced 13 years before my dad was alive. Why didn't they go ask my dad? But it was their way of getting to me. Eventually, I was questioned by the KGB as well in the same manner. So what, what I learned uh, by dealing with the two of them, I, I met a second time at the FBI as well, is that they really seem to be trained at the same exact school and they have tunnel vision. And when they see red flags, and the red flag of course was a young American girl flying in and out of Russia under communism every three months, I know that's a red flag. But they could not comprehend any other reason that anybody would ever be going in every three months except if you were a spy. So for me, it was very frustrating that I was trying to explain about the music and that I was trying to show what we have in common between our, our two countries and that, you know, music that has no borders. It was like hitting a concrete wall. And, and it just, you know, was wearing on me because I was also always nervous about getting my visa declined. So when the FBI met with me, I was so nervous that if the KGB was watching me and saw me with the FBI, well, there, they're going to say I'm a spy. So, it, you know, it was, it was a little ridiculous dealing with both. It also was very scary. Yeah, and, can... and, and the most interesting thing is I did spend two or three years trying to get my FBI file. I know a couple pages are up there. And it's amazing that in my FBI file, they actually say, it is possible that she's already working with the Soviets. So they, they actually thought there was a possibility I was a spy. It, it was really, it was absurd. That, that's crazy. And actually, uh, at some point, your visa uh, was um, uh, rejected. After, and, th and that's a very strange story. After your uh, double record, Red Wave, uh, became popular, it actually started the popularity and the acceptance of uh, the underground rock music in the Soviet Union. But at the same time, and especially at the time that you were planning to get married in uh, the Soviet Union, you didn't get a visa to go back. How did that happen? You know, it was devastating. And, and what I learned by being in Russia is that nothing is concrete there. You know, we all thought of the Soviet Union as this big, powerful nation that was always on the same page. And that is so far from the truth, because like the United States, when you have something very big, there's a lot of bureaucracies. So when Red Wave came out, and I knew they were very angry that the press put, I smuggled stuff, I was sure I was getting my visa decline. I did not get my visa decline the two trips after Red Wave came out. I even went to VOP, the Russian publishing company, and ended up signing a paper admitting that I illegally took the music, and I'm so sorry, and I paid a fee, and then they said, oh, great, now we can work with you. And I was in the middle of all of these deals to bring Bowie over to Russia to play a concert, to get Boris a record deal in the States. I was, I was at the time where it was the only time I didn't feel like my visa would be declined. I was engaged to marry uh, Yuri Kasparian. I left to go to the States. And 30 of us were all ready to go for my wedding. And that's when my visa was declined. And, and it, it was devastating and I was so shocked and it didn't make any sense. But that's the thing about Russia. It is so unpredictable and it doesn't make sense. You know, when the Moscow KGB had something and they were mad at me, they wouldn't tell the Leningrad KGB. So sometimes when I settled things in Moscow, I thought, okay, everything's going to be great. That's the time at the airport I get my video cassettes taken from me. So there's no rhyme or reason what happened. Um, right. But it took me six months to get back in. I had a lot of help from, from the American government, from American politicians. Most uh, was Senator Alan Cranston, who just kept pushing because his only thought about my issue was when two people are in love, you never keep them apart. So he was relentless in his efforts to get me in. And um, through him, uh, Secretary of State um, George Schultz, had a meeting with Chevron Nazi setting up a meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan. And in that meeting, Schultz supposedly brought up, how can Gorbachev boast the last notes when he's keeping people apart that want to get married? Oh, so it yeah. took about six or seven months to get off of the 
uh, the bad list, I guess you call it. And I finally did yeah. get in and got married. With Yuri Kasparian, who was uh, the guitarist of uh, the band Kino, which is one of the four bands you uh, uh, introduced in the United States. So, yeah. Yes, he was the guitar player. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So you mentioned already that many of the musicians were also active in other cultural expressions, uh, painting uh, and visual art among them. Uh, can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about your involvement with the visual arts and the art exhibitions you, um, uh, in, uh, you organized in the United States um, based on artwork you actually brought out of the country? Um, well, I was bringing in, as I said earlier, musical equipment for them. And I would go to equipment companies here and show them the rockers, have them see videos, and they were throwing stuff at me. And so I would be bringing in equipment. I also would be bringing in acrylic paints. The artists were also unofficial. So it meant they couldn't have access to supplies, to canvases and things. And what was so cool about that is that they did their art completely for themselves. So they had one of the guys, Timur Novikov, that's sort of the new painter, somehow got this whole floor of this building that looked like it should have been condemned. But they had all of these rooms and they would paint on whatever they could get. They would paint on shower curtains, they would paint on boards, they would paint, and they would do it just for their own enjoyment, just to express what they felt inside. And as you can see in the photo, that's one of the artists, Africa Bugayev, who's actually sleeping on the art. They would do their art and then just take it off and do another one. Again, there was nothing about selling it, making money. It was just a pure form of artistic expression. And you know, I just was always in awe of them. You know, all of the Russians, the rockers, the artists, the poets, they really showed me a different side to life and it was the freedom of spirit. You know, we have freedom in the United States in terms of how we live concretely and how we can, you know, go get through our daily lives. But I learned that the freedom of spirit is almost more important and, and figuring out who you are on the inside and dealing with your internal struggles. So I, I was just so impressed by everything they represented. They also did, there were underground filmmakers that would somehow find some old archaic camera and make these crazy films. Um, the middle photo you can see is a, a performance. They did performance art. You know, it was just a mixture of everything. It, it was just creativity at, at its highest level. Right. So by the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, you became immensely popular in the Soviet Union, also due to your own uh, performances and your music was produced. Your music videos were screened. And in 1993, you got your own regular music program on Russian television, interviewing musicians from the West, among whom uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Alice Cooper, David Bowie, David Byrne. And uh, I read in your book there was even a Stingray look-alike contest in 1994. So how did you experience this uh, rise to stardom? You know, when I spent all the time there in the early years, um, part of the Tusafka, hanging out and doing nothing, I started to write songs of Boris. And he was so fluent in English, he was even a poet in English, that we wrote lyrics and music together with many of the other artists, Victor Tsoi, Kosti Kinchis, Sergei Pyrokin. I wrote songs with them, maybe they would write the music, I would write the lyrics. But I evolved as an artist through them. They were all like my teachers. So by the 90s, when, when Glasnost came and, and, we, and, and it was changing into capitalism, I ended up having my own career. And it, it was, you know, it was very intense. It was very exciting. Um, most of my fans were young girls and they were incredible. They were just so full of life. And they were so in awe of see, seeing what they saw as, as a strong female figure. And I was in videos on motorcycles in the desert, and I was kicking and, 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 and fighting playfully with guys. You know, I was doing a lot of stuff that the Soviet women usually didn't do. So, um, you know, it, it was a very exciting time for me. And it also allowed me, through becoming popular with my music, that I could express myself in so many ways in Russia. Like you said, I had my own TV program and it was amazing because I interviewed all these Western artists and I got to sit down and, and really ask them questions to, to find out who they are as people and how do they deal um, you know, with their fame and things. So I felt very lucky in Russia because the channels just 
opened for me and whatever I could think of in my head, I, I could make happen. It, it was, it was a very, um, it was just a very exciting time to, to be a creative yeah. person and to be a, a woman in Russia. And, you know, there weren't really any other uh, female rockers. So I think, you know, the allure of me being a woman, I had dark sunglasses off on. So, it, you know, I had kind of this powerful image. I think, I think it was needed for the young girls. And uh, for me, it was great. And then I could use my fame with them. I had a big campaign that was called Don't Litter because Russians would just throw all their trash on the streets. And again, I might not have changed a lot of people's behavior, but I probably got a thousand young girls in Russia to, to stop littering. And that, you know, to me was a big deal and it felt really good. Now I can imagine and you also supported uh, Greenpeace uh, based on your fame, right? So you were very active in the environmental uh, awareness movement. Uh, I, before we go to the Q&A, I want to um, um, ask you um, something that connects, uh, be, uh, that connects past and present. So Victor Tsoi, who you mentioned from Kino, um, the band leader who tra tra tragically died in a car accident, he saw music as a doorway to a brighter world. And also you wrote um, that in your book that rock music is always about transformation. In that spirit, how do you see the role of music in addressing the current very confused and radically polarized world? And do you recognize a young generation of musicians who actually successfully uh, address those issues? You know, first of all, I can say that what happened in Leningrad in the 80s with rock music turned out to be an iconic period um, that can't be repeated. It's very similar to what happened in the US with rock music in the 60s. And when you're in those time periods, you don't understand how powerful, important, and long lasting they're gonna be. So I don't know if there's up and coming rockers or musicians in either country that can do something to change the world as it happened then. But I do think in general that music and the arts uh, is a much more powerful way to change things by showing people we have a connection and political rhetoric. I've always believed that, that through the arts, um, you can build a bridge and, and, and have people come together. You know, it, there is a lot of turmoil in the world now. And, and my phrase that somehow popped in my head a couple of weeks ago that, that feels good in this moment is a quote by C, uh, C uh, S. Lewis that is, what you see or hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. So to be me, my only advice for people is to go stand somewhere else. Everything that happened to me was because I moved and was standing in Russia. And if we can all just go and stand other places, we can just get different views of each other and we can find the connections we need to understand that we're all on this world together and we all want the same things. Well, on that uh, beautiful perspective, we are moving to the Q&A. We already have a bunch of questions. Um, just um, uh, let me repeat that the questions I will read are from the Q&A box, not the chat box. So please put them there. And we'll start with Molly Zuckerman. Do you think there is any equivalent to this underground rock scene in St. Petersburg now? Are you aware of any? You know, again, I, again, I don't. And you know why all of this 80s rock in Russia has become very nostalgic to the Russian people the same way the 60s did to us. After a generation, after 25 years, you know, everybody becomes nostalgic. I, I think that the musicians that were poignant and, and, and their words really affected people in the 80s are still all very famous. The ones that are alive are still very famous today. So I personally, I know there are a few interesting uh, rock bands that were in the 90s and 2000s, but I don't think anything has happened compared to what happened in Leningrad in the 80s. Right. Uh, Rose Dosti asked uh, where um, people can listen to this music. I, I guess we can uh, put some links in um, uh, the chat for that. Yeah, I mean, all these artists, you know, Boris Kravinchikov still makes new music, still records. Elisa still makes new music and records. Unfortunately, about half of the band, the people on the bands on Red Wave have passed away, but you can find all their music on YouTube, on Spotify, 
on you know, I, iTunes music. I, I think it's all out there. So hopefully, hopefully people will go listen. It's worth it. It's very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Joan Agayanian Quinn writes, Hi, I was among the 30 people going to the wedding. We went without the bride. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, yes. Yeah, who was that? And that's uh, Joan Agayanian Quinn. Oh, that's right. Joan Quinn. Oh, my gosh. Joan, hello, Joan. She's amazing. You know, it, it was, my whole world was taken away. And, um, you know, there were 30 people. There were supposed to be 30 visas. There were 29 visas. And I got stuck at home and I felt like I was in prison. It was a horrible, horrible time in my life. And I know that hardship gives us layers to who we are and, and it makes us stronger people. But if I could have made that gone away and got married when I was supposed to, it, it, it would have been better. It was, it was very right. difficult. Right, now I understand, yeah. Bruce Hollihan writes, are you aware of any bands in Russia like Spooky Moo? My friend Kevin Lefe uh, was involved with Brian Eno in their Opal Records release in the USA in 1989. And do you know of any KGB infiltration of Soviet rock bands? I'm aware of Tatiana Besson, who was in the uh, GDR band, the Firma, who was allegedly a Stasi informant. So basically, um, right. did the KGB actually right. send Yeah, Yeah, I, I, first of all, I know Zvuki move very well. They were uh -huh. probably the most famous and coolest underground Moscow band. Um, and Peter Mamonov, who's their leader, is just insane. And um, I was there when Brian Eno was there. And Brian Eno was so cool. He was into all this music and he recorded some of it. What I can say, I, I don't know exactly if any of the rockers specifically were KGB, but Russian life in general was always to be suspect of who you were talking to. And many of the rockers and the people around them spoke, you know, um, pretty, pretty fluent English. So whenever they did, you always thought they must be an informant. They speak English, they must be an informant. Also, many of the bands, Boris, Victor, Alisa, all of them, would get, get called once or twice a year from the KGB in Leningrad to come down and they wanted to talk with them. And some of them would, some of them would just hang up the phone. So I don't know, it was so difficult. You know, I remember Artem Troitsky, who is the, was the only rock journalist in Russia and found many of these young rock bands in other parts of the Soviet Union, was very um, up on Western music, knew a lot of things. So we, and spoke great English that we of course thought, thought he was an informant. So, you know, you're living in this life like Big Brother. You know, not telling on people, not knowing who is who. It was a crazy atmosphere. But I don't know if any of the rockers specifically worked for the KGB, but I certainly know that they all spoke to them at one time or another. Right, right. Michelle Willens uh, asked, did your life and other musicians' lives change depending on who was running in the Soviet Union? You know, it's, 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 um, that's a really good question, and it didn't. And that's what I loved about this scene I fell into. Because here is this Soviet Union, this communist country, where there's all these rules and you can't do things, and they kind of had their own world within the Soviet Union. You know, they, they kind of just had a parallel society with the Soviet society, and not on the streets, because that's where you could be seen and get in trouble, but behind closed doors at that time under communism, they were behaving and acting exactly like we were. They're drinking, some of them smoking pot, some of them are piercing their ears, some of them are dyeing their hair, they're laughing, they're telling jokes. I mean, I found the Russian people to be so similar to Americans, and I, I had been many other countries, and Russia was one of the closest I felt that we had in, in common and similar lifestyles. The parallels were not just between the KGB and the FBI, but also between the people on another level. Exactly, and between, and between mothers, because when Yuri and I got engaged, Yuri, Yuri's mother started saying, what, have you guys made a plan? How are you gonna make money? Where are you gonna live? How are you gonna raise the children? And then when I was back in LA, my mother said those exact same words. They might as well have been the same mother. So there are some, some things that have no borders, that are just the same the worldwide. Great. Merit Brenneman uh, asks, I loved your multilingual cover of uh, Love is No Joke. 
released this summer. Did you record it in the 80s or recently? And did you do the translations of the verses? Could you tell us a little bit about the track? Yeah, so I, as I said early, wrote songs with a lot of the musicians. But when I was an enemy of the Russian state and I couldn't get in there for six or seven months, I would just be sitting at home crying and I would be listening to their music all the time and, and feeling that my connection with them was slowly being teared away as time went on. And when I was listening to some of their songs, I would just get these English lyrics in my head. So I wrote English lyrics to some of Gravinchkov songs, some of Costa Kincha songs, and some of the Kino songs. And Love Is No Joke is one of the songs I wrote. Now, instead of, instead of writing new English lyrics, those lyrics I actually wrote in English that were on the same similar theme of Victor's, which is why when I recorded it, I kept the choruses in Russian. But by the time I got back to Russia and then started recording and having my albums put out on Melodia, which is about 89 was the first time, Victor and Kino were so huge and so famous. And of course, Victor's songs were all so important to the Russian people. I never put it out. I never released it. And uh, August 15th, uh, over a month ago, was the 30th anniversary of the death of Victor Tsoi. And Victor's widow said to me, Joanna, you have to do something. And I kept thinking, what can I do to honor my friend? Because I'd love to keep his face and his music and his words and his energy in the world. And so I decided to release that song. And I was very lucky. A good friend of mine, George Ishtak, uh, who's a producer and director and, and loves Russian rock, I sent him all my footage and he helped um, edit together that video. So I was... I was so pleased to put out something nobody had ever hear that, that is for Victor and, and to help people remember and love him and his music. Right, right. Christy Davis asked, uh, did you meet the musicians from DDT? Oh, love DDT. Love Yuri Shevchuk, the leader. And, you know, as a Westerner, of course, when I saw their music, of course, in your mind, you think, wow, you know, Boris is like Bowie. He looked like him, he moved a little bit. And when I saw Strange Games, in concert, I said, wow, they're like, you know, the ska band in England. Oh, I forgot now their name. That cool madness in London. So, um, and, and, you know, Costa Kincha was like a, a Billy Idol, almost a mix. So um, DDT was incredible because Yuri Shevchuk to me was like a Bruce Springsteen in the sense he had this very big gravelly voice. And when he sang, you could feel it to your bones. And, and it was just mesmerizing. And um, he was a little bit later. Why those bands weren't on Red Wave was that that band, Nautilus Pompilius, Televisor, they all came about a year after I started going, before Kino and all of those bands. But my favorite song of DDT is a song called Actress of the Spring. And it was written for his wife that had died the year before. And it's one of my favorite songs. He was a beautiful, prolific writer. And it's a, it's a very important band, DDT. Love DDT. Great, thanks. Liana Schirmer asks, can you speak to the idea that these artists, and specifically Boris, didn't find commercial success in the West? Not that they wanted it, but it never caught on here, or? Yeah. You know, you I, I, and I thought about this a lot, you know, writing my books and going back through history. First of all, when I put out Red Wave, it wasn't to make them, you know, successful and huge to make a lot of money. It was to actually just have Americans see another side of Russia that wasn't being shown. And in that sense, it was very successful. We sold 20,000 records. It, there was press everywhere, which was so important. But I, I knew that it would always be a roadblock that they were singing in Russian. And Russian rock, especially in the 80s, was, was so powerful with the lyrics and, and what it was saying. And when you live under communism, lyrics are so important because you're reading through the line, you're getting a sense of what are they really saying. So I knew, I knew that would be difficult. I, I did know that the only one that had a chance to be famous in the West and certainly had the talent to be famous in the West was Boris, because Boris was as prolific a poet in English as he is in Russian. And I thought his album was great. I loved it. But maybe, you know, Dave Stewart producing it just went in an area that maybe didn't click with people. Maybe if Boris had put out a, a folk album, which Boris had really always been kind of a bard almost and a, a, a folk hero seeing many concerts just on acoustic guitar, but then also electric, maybe if they would have gone a different way. But again, I, I think 
I think he had the potential and listen, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, there's no rhyme or reason. Um, I did find on another note that when I did the art exhibits, that the art didn't have that barrier that the music had. The art was amazing art. So when critics and famous people came to see the art, they didn't say, this is great Russian art. They said, this is incredible world art. So the art, you know, could transcend any borders or any differences. But unfortunately, the Russian rock has the Russian language, which is so poetic and so incredible. Some of my favorite phrases in the world are, are Russian. One of my favorites is, I simply can't survive without you. I mean, it's, it's a wonder, wonderful language. Great, thank you. Susanna Altman writes, were you involved in producing Asa, the film? And are you still in contact with protagonists of back then and observe how they do today artistically? You know, I unfortunately was not part of Asa at all because they filmed Asa in the seven months that I was an enemy of the Russian state. So for me, it was sad that I couldn't be part of it. And, you know, part of me being stuck at home where I couldn't get back to Russia is that I knew their lives went on. You know, Russians have always had hardship. It's just part of every day, every week, something happens and it's a speed bump and you've got to get over it and you've got to move on. So my biggest sadness and fear when, when I had my visa decline was that they were going to forget me because I know they go on. Um, but I did find out later that they all wrote, wrote letters that all the musicians of the rock club signed to a newspaper, you know, explaining that it wasn't okay, I wasn't there. I did miss Asa, but I will tell you when I came back is when Asa came back, came out, and uh, anyone that's seen Asa, the end of the film has a three or four minute um, scene of Victor where he then ends up performing. And that three or four minute scene changed everything for Kino. You know, they were so famous on an underground level, but that, that last scene in Asa took Kino up, up so high and changed everything for them. And it was a, it was a very cool, um, you know, kind of new way film in a sense. And I, I know Sergei Solovyov, and I'm sorry that I missed that whole period of making that film. Right. Next question is from uh, Wolf Gruner. Are you aware of connections between the Soviet musicians and underground music artists in other communist countries at the time? There were a lot of connections locally and regionally between musicians in East Germany, but I can't remember visits from musicians of other, other socialist countries when I was attending private concerts of underground parties in East Berlin. Yeah. You know, that's true, and I do not remember hearing them talk about other underground bands in some of the other Soviet republics. What I do know is that they were hungry and loved the up-and-coming independent bands out of England. You know, they, when I did interviews with them, thought that American bands by the 80s had sold out. They had multi-million dollar record deals and they believe that makes musicians dull, that you subconsciously start to please your boss that's giving you all this money. So they weren't interested in Western rock in the 80s, but they were very interested in all these bands that I had never heard of. So they were turning me on to new music. They turned me on to the Cocteau Twins, they turned me on to the cult, the cure, the Smiths. They were hungry for this independent British music. I don't ever remember hearing any of them talk about underground from the other Soviet republics. I do know through Artem Troitsky, they had their eyes open to cool bands from Vladivostok, from Ufa, which is where uh, Shevchuk came from, DDT, from Sverdlovsk, the fabulous band, band Chaif. So all since Leningrad was the first rock club, there was a second one in Moscow. Eventually there were many more, but Leningrad was really the center of what was happening. All of these underground bands would come from all over the Soviet Union. That's such a huge place and come to perform at the rock club. So they were very open into seeing up and coming rock, Russian rock bands. So when, um, we are actually at the time now. I want to finish with two questions and apologize for all the other questions we can't uh, answer at this uh, point. First is by Molly Zuckerman. She writes, I would argue that there hasn't been any really new good modern rock music in Russia since the times of Kino. The most popular artists in Russia now tend towards pop, like Monetochka, Cream Soda, etc. 
Do you agree with that or are there some contemporary underground rockers that are not just not wildly popular yet? You know, I do agree with that. And I, I think, again, the same way in America, we just saw this documentary, Laurel Canyon, the two part documentary about all of the 60s artists that lived together in Laurel Canyon. That was a period that was magic and it just happened. And Leningrad was a, a period that was magic. And sometimes the forces come together in the universe and they make something that lasts forever, that people feel inside, that touches their soul. And I think it's very hard to compare to Boris Gorbachev, to Viktor Tsoi, uh, you know, to DDT, to these bands. And you know, there's something about doing it when you can't get paid for it. Because if you can't get paid for it, there's no other reason you're doing it, then you have to do it. Making music for them was like the air that kept them alive. And, and there's something so pure in that form. And that's why I say, I, I, I learned about the freedom of spirit and how powerful that is. And, and when there's nothing that influences why you do something, you're purely doing it because you feel it. And I think times have just changed and it doesn't mean something like that might not happen in the future, but I agree with that question that I don't think there has been anybody as important or as iconic as those 80s artists. Right. So I have to uh, finish with one um, final question from Irina who writes, Joanna, there are a lot of Russians living in the US who are fans of Russian rock music and very thankful to you for what you have done supporting Russian musicians. Do you plan to have any meetings, presentations with Russians here in the US at some point? I would definitely attend. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I love Russians and I love Americans and French, anybody that wants to know or listen to Russian music. You know, um, I was supposed to have a large presentation in person and book signing at the Vend Museum. They were going to present my book. And unfortunately, because of COVID, that was canceled. But I'm grateful to be online today. And I'm very grateful for everybody that came on and asked questions. And I hope when the world gets back to any sense of normalcy, I will be doing book signings in bookstores in DC, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, hopefully some other places. So I, 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 I love when people are interested in this story and I'm grateful that people are paying attention and getting the book and, and reading it and looking at what I'm doing. So thank you so much. Joanna, I want to thank you very much for so generously sharing your stories, your thoughts, and your feelings. It was a great pleasure to have you in this series. Yeah. Thank you. Mir, you rock and roll. Absolutely. So next week, uh, my guest is Alex Vitali, a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. He's also the author of The End of Policing, much discussed uh, book. Please note that uh, next week uh, for once we are having this interview on Thursday instead of Wednesday but same time as usual. Thank you very much again for uh, being part of this and have a wonderful week. Hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.